okay, we will fix it better in your, in your brains, right? Okay, so what is this about? Uh, we talk, we talk uh, a lot about uh, transition, and in fact, one of the things that I always mention is uh, when you hear somebody talking about migration, they don't know what they are talking about. There is not such thing as a migration in IPv6, because migration means like when you have a Windows XP and you install Windows 7 or Windows 10, you don't keep both of them working together. Okay? You have one or the other. You can keep the files for both of them in the hard disk drive, but you either boot Windows XP or boot Windows 7 or Windows 10, right? In IPv6 and IPv4, there is not such thing because you cannot tell everybody in the world, let's switch off IPv4 tonight at 12, and one minute later or five minutes later, let's switch on with IPv6. That's not possible, okay? And if we are able to do that in terms of routing, what it will happen is that the applications will break because there are many applications that don't work yet, unfortunately, with IPv6. So you should not say migration. In fact, if you look at the ITF documents, there is nothing such migration. Sometimes we have used the migration term, but if you look for migration uh, protocols, there is nothing such, such that. Every protocol for IPv4 to IPv6 is called a transition or transition and coexistence. Okay, so that's very, very important point to understand the difference. So what has been the, the goal for ITF when developing uh, IPv6? Of course, they are not compatible protocols. So we try it to make that transition and coexistence as much as smooth as possible. It's never 100% perfect. There are always cases where something can fail. There are ways to solve that. But basically, you cannot expect everything to be working 100% uh, perfect. And, and in some sense, that's good. Because if everything is working perfect, we will never move finally to IPv6 only internet, right? So we need to break sometimes things uh, to be able to push everyone to go to IPv6. So basically, we have uh, three methodologies for this transition and coexistence. The first one is dual stack. Dual stack is just what I mentioned. You have IPv4 stack, you have IPv6 stack, both work together, and the applications or sometimes the operating system decide which one is going to use, okay? So if we have uh, like a balance where today we have most of the weight of the traffic, of the internet traffic being IPv4, the goal is that as much as more and more services uh, have IPv6 capabilities and more and more uh, clients have IPv6 capabilities, the traffic will change the balance, okay, like that. How much that will take? Well, we have been doing that already, and right now we have about 30, almost close to 30% of the internet traffic being IPv6. And if you look to big content providers like Google, uh, Yahoo, uh, Facebook, of course, YouTube, etc., etc., uh, most of the companies that have uh, IPv6 enabled, 60% of their traffic is going to those places. So that means 60% of the, the, their traffic is already or can be already IPv6, which is a lot. It's more than half. My expectation, and this is trying to look into the crystal ball, is that we will surpass the 50 or, six or even 60% of IPv6 global traffic in Internet in about two years. So if you are not ready today, you're starting to be ready today, you will be late, okay? It's a matter of competition. Uh, I think if you have seen the presentation from Jeff Houston the first day, he said that. At the end, what, what makes some countries to move faster when there is one ISP that deploys IPv6, all the others are forced to do the same. So then the traffic in the country goes like that. It's not slowly, it's like very, very quick steps. So. The next group of transition technologies is tunnels. We all know what it means, a tunnel. A tunnel is uh, a VPN, for example. So we are used to tunnels, but today we use most of the time IPv4 and IPv4. 
And then the last one is translation. A few days, a few years ago, when I was uh, teaching about IPv6, I always said, uh, look, this is ugly. Don't do it. Don't do translation. It's, it breaks things. Unfortunately, that's true if we have deployed IPv6 before we exhaust the IPv4 addresses. But that, that didn't happen. So now we have no other way than doing translation. OK? So uh, I think I mentioned all this, so I don't think to explain anything else. Well, maybe for those that, that don't know too much about IPv6, how the applications or the operating system choose if they need to use IPv4 or IPv6? Easy. Let's suppose we have a website, and the website is IPv6 enabled. The website will have eight records for the IPv4 addresses, and the website will have also what we call the quad eight records for the IPv6 addresses, OK? So if a client is trying to contact the website, is making queries to the website, if the client is also IPv6 enabled, he will get both the A records and the quad A records, and it will be give preference to the IPv6 one. Okay, so only in case after some time, which typically in most of the operating systems today it's about 100, 150 milliseconds, only in the case that IPv6 is not getting back, will fall back and will restart the conversation using IPv4. Okay. So that's why as soon as we have more content providers and more clients which IPv6 enable, the balance between IPv4 and IPv6 will change quickly. Okay? Uh, this is the representation of an IPv6 only stack, dual stack, and IPv4 uh, only stack. Uh, what I want to show this, simple, because People believe that the stack is something very, very complex, very huge in an operating system. Actually, it's not. An IPv4 stack today is so well uh, coded that it takes maybe about 30 kilobytes only. And dual stack don't mean 30 plus 30. Dual stack, because TCP and UDP basically is the same, is actually an hybrid stack. So typically, a dual stack or an hybrid stack it's something like 10 or 15% more than just an IPv4 stack, OK? So that's important. Now, let's suppose this is the BML, right? Yeah. Let's suppose we have a situation. Of course, the, the perfect situation will be to have dual stack. If we have dual stack, we can talk with all machines that have IPv4 only, and we can talk with new machines that in the future will have IPv6 only. For example, one, one case for this will be cellular phones. Cellular phones will be the first, uh, let's say, operating system or set of devices that will be IPv6 only. Why? There are many reasons for that. And one of them is battery conservation. There is a study from Nokia from a few years ago that explains that because the NAT in IPv4, uh, there is a need to do what they call uh, keep alive, which is sending a packet every 30 seconds. So that means, hey, I am here, keep my pores open, because otherwise incoming connections cannot go in. So that means extra battery. It has been calculated that probably is taking 20 to 25% of the daily battery of a cellular phone. Okay? And in addition to that, it means extra radio bandwidth, which is expensive for the operators. Okay, so there is a need to go to IPv6 only. This is just one of the reasons for that. There are many others. Okay, so we will see uh, more and more IPv6 only cellular networks, and then we can see, for example, that we have an all weather sensor in Alaska, and nobody is going to replace it, and the vendor don't exist, so nobody can upgrade that that sensor to to support uh, B6, right? So not the problem. If we have a cellular phone trying to get to the web page of the sensor or trying to collect some data from the sensor, the ISP can have this kind of translator that allows the data to go to the application level like a kind of proxy, OK? We all know what's a, a proxy. It's basically the same. For simple protocols like HTTP, HTTPS, this is, this is working always, never, never got broken. OK, so this is this is the thing about, yes, dual stack is the best, but unfortunately, not always is possible, not because the cost of the stack or anything like that, not 
there is not an extra cost in terms of hardware for dual stack support. If you have a 10 years old CPE, you can put on it a Linux with dual stack and you don't lose performance. There is not a reason for hardware, CPU, or memory or anything like that. That's not a real problem. It's more having the resources to access the code to upgrade it like uh, the example I put about the sensor sitting in Alaska, okay? Now, tunnels. I also explain it this very, very quickly. Uh, there are many, many technologies to do tunneling. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, the one that is more frequent is what we call 164, which is actually protocol 41. So what we do basically is we have a network or a part of a network that is not IPv6 ready. Let's suppose you have an ISP, your case that you mentioned yesterday. Your transit provider is not offering you uh, IPv6 support. How you can do that? Let's suppose this is your ISP network and this is, uh, for example, Hurricane Electric. Hurricane Electric can give you a BGP tunnel to do that. So you can still offer IPv6 to your customers. Okay, so despite part of internet for you, which is your transit provider right now, is not offering IPv6, you can still do this, encapsulate your IPv6 packets in IPv4 once. What that means? 20 extra bytes. So the MTU will drop in 20 bytes, okay? Because it's the size of the IPv4 header that you need to put in every packet. In a, in a transit network, that's not a problem, okay? So that will be a problem if you need to configure manual tunnels to every customer and so on. That's the reason this is not used by default for customers. But Hurricane Electric, for example, is offering what they call the tunnel broker service, tunnelbroker.net, which also offers this for, for every customer. I have it in my home. In my home, I get a tunnel to, to, to Hurricane Electric, and I get a slash 48 for my home. Simple, okay? At no cost, of course. Translation. I already explained it that as well. Let me go into next slides so, so you get more ideas about what, what I am talking here. Uh, let's, see, let's see what is, what is the main problem that you as uh, ISPs or enterprise networks have when deploying IPv6. In ITF, we did something that we believe uh, at that time, it was a nice idea. It was trying to make one uh, transition mechanism for every specific case. Trying to make it as perfect as possible, right? The problem is that's very nice, it works, we get learning, we improve the transition mechanism, but for you, how come you are going to study 100 transition mechanisms to decide what to use in your network? And at the end, are you really interested in deploying two or three transition mechanisms in your network? The ideal will be to have just one for every customer, right? That will be the ideal solution. So you don't have to buy different boxes or, or different licenses or whatever is needed for, for running those. So, uh, of course, I am not going in this, in this short tutorial. We did that last week for the people that was in the workshop. I am not going to run to, to all of those. And the goal of this uh, tutorial is to concentrate in those that I believe today will make sense for you. And I will also tell you what is my thinking about which one is the best one and the one that you, you should use. So, as a reminder, most of the vendors are going to try to sell you carrier-grade NAT boxes. This is wrong. Don't buy them. Don't trust the vendors. They just want to sell you boxes, okay? Carrier-grade NAT is just artificially extending the life of IPv4, and it has many implications. Uh, with carrier-grade NAT, what you are doing is the public IPv4 addresses that before were in the one link of the customer, in the CP of the customer, you are moving them to here. But you keep also the NAT4 at the customer CP. You can do that, like in this case, without actually deploying IPv6. So you don't need to change or upgrade the customer CP. You just set up a carrier ring NAT in your network, uh, well, uh, let me explain. AFTR stands for Address Family Transition Router. That's the terminology that ITF uses, okay? So it's the terminology in the standards. Uh, but everybody call it 
LSN for large scale NAT or CG NAT or carry ray NAT or CGN, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many names, but at the end, everything is the same. So the thing here is that we are setting up two levels of NAT. One that we already have, everyone in his network today typically has a NAT, and then we are setting up another NAT. What that means, two levels of translation. Some applications break because that. Okay, that's the first question. That's the first issue. Second thing, how do you share IPv4 addresses among customers? Obviously, reducing the number of ports that you allocate to them. For example, you can have 60 customers in a single IPv4 address by giving them only 1,000 ports, which is not good because that means that some customers may use only 300 ports and some others need more. So what happens? You have problems. You get applications that break. And you have situations like PlayStation Network that when they detect IPv4 addresses sitting here in a carry ray NAT, they put those addresses in a blacklist. And this blacklist is forever. They deny to delete the addresses from the blacklist, not because they don't want. It's because they cannot identify the people using their games if they are sharing addresses. Okay, so there is no way for them to solve the problem. So what happens? You pay to the vendor, like I saw an article two weeks ago, I think it was here in Apinic. Uh, a vendor was saying he's investing $2.4 million every year during the next three years in buying carry green ad boxes. Okay, they didn't realize it, that if they do that, they will need to invest, well, they said, we invest that because this way we don't need to buy IP4 addresses. What they didn't realize it is that if they do that, they will sooner or later start recycling the actual IPv4 addresses. And when all those addresses get blacklisted by Sony and other players, they will need also, in addition to the carry green ad boxes, to buy new addresses. So they are, they are really very, very silly because they are actually saying, we don't need to buy addresses because we, we buy carry green ad. OK, but then later, you will need also to buy addresses. So that, that's really, really stupid. It doesn't make sense. I don't think they are looking at the situation. Many things bro get broken with carry green net. I am not saying some of them have solutions. Most of them actually have solutions. But what that means is that you need to deploy what, you, what we call ALGs, application layer gateways. And if you have a carry green net that costs you $200,000, you need to have at least two because you need to have high availability. Okay? And maybe this carry green net is supporting I don't know, uh, 100,000 users. But if you start setting up ALGs in the carry green net, instead of supporting 100,000 users, maybe supporting only half. So at the end, this is also an extra cost. Okay, so if you solve the problems that carry green net is creating, you need to buy actually more boxes. So your network gets more and more expensive. Um, I wanted to show you something. Well, this is, this is from about one year ago. We are working with Europol and other law enforcement authorities because they are complaining that, and I have seen reports about crimes, uh, people getting killed, and not being able to research who is the guilty because the, uh, the ways to look for, for who was the guilty involves investigating 60 people that were sharing the same IP address. And the judge will not give a court order to investigate 60 people. So that's a real thing. It's happening. And it's happening everywhere where you share addresses. There is one bank in, uh, in uh, Netherlands, Rather Bank, that they started deploying uh, two years ago IPv6. And when the journalists, when they introduced the thing to the press, when the journalists asked them why you started deploying IPv6, they said only for one reason, because we don't want or we cannot identify customers when the ISPs start using category net. We have a real problem. It's a security problem. Okay? So it makes the life more complex for everyone running on that network. And this was fun. Uh, just two days ago, I saw in the nano mailing list this email that say, I have a ticket open with OpenDNS about filtering happening on some of our IP carry net ranges. 
So it's not only Sony. Other people is starting to filter addresses that are behind Carry Grey NAT. Okay? So that's the reality. As soon as you deploy Carry Grey NAT, you will find this kind of problems. And this is going to be growing and growing and growing. You know the answer from the people in the Nanog list? Hey guys, we told you two years ago that you should start deploying IPv6, then you should not have this problem, right? It's obvious. So, what is going now? We don't have IPv4 addresses. I think that's clear for, for everybody. Uh, in some cases, we, it's okay if we have addresses to deploy dual stack. I know some folks here have talked to me, hey, we don't need any transition mechanism, or we can just use the standard, let's say the full transition mechanism, which is dual stack, because I have 10,000 IPv4 addresses and I have only 3,000 customers. Okay, then you are good. You can keep gr growing your network probably for two years or three years and you will still having addresses, but not because that you should stop moving to IPv6. It's good for you because you don't need to deploy any transition mechanism except uh, dual stack, right? So that's, that's good, that's easy and, and it's my recommendation. If you have sufficient addresses, not for now, for the next two or three years, make sure about that, check how is your network growing, you are good just doing dual stack, okay? But if you have addresses for one year, please don't go to dual stack because you are going to change your network twice in two years, okay? I have, there is one case for this. AT&T in US was using one transition technology that was 6RD. And after two years of changing his network, now they needed to decide to change to another technology. So they spent the money twice. They invested two years in moving to 6RD and replacing CPEs or upgrading them or whatever, and now they need to move into something else. Okay, so pay attention to that. It's not just having addresses for now, it's having addresses for the next couple of years at least. If you expect your network to work farther to the number of addresses you have, you are not good with dual stack at the moment, okay? It may be okay for a trial, for a small group of customers, but not for a real massive deployment. Um, so now, the recommendation obviously is we need to start thinking in IPv6 only. And what it means IPv6 only? Well, that's, that's difficult to say because IPv6 only Actually, I am not suggesting to remove IPv4 from every part of your network. You need to keep dual stack with your upstreams. You need to keep dual stack, for example, with corporate customers. You need to keep dual stack somehow in data centers. Maybe not, we will see it later. But you don't need to keep dual stack in your access network for broadband customers. And you don't need to keep dual stack for uh, mobile networks. Okay, so you can go to IPv6 only for those parts of the networks that actually consume more IPv4 addresses. That's, that's the thing. Now, what technologies we can use for this IPv6 only network? The older one, and this, this one got uh, quite good deployment in different countries in the world, is what we call dual stack light. Dual, dual stack light is kind of tunneling plus NAT. How we can see that? Very simple. Here we have what we call the B4, which is a replacement or an upgrade to an existing CPE that allows bridging IPv4 up to the carrier grade NAT. Of course, this is using carrier grade NAT. IPv6 goes plain, no translation, nothing special, so this becomes an IPv6 router, but an IPv4 bridge, okay? So we don't do any more here NAT. This is the advantage compared with plain carry ring NAT. We have only one level of NAT, but still we need to share addresses among customers. So what we had here is still the same problem, okay? But at least we don't have one level and two levels of NAT. That's the difference. And that solved the problem for many applications. Not the poor sharing, but at least solved the problem for uh, having several levels of NAT. Um, 
in case you don't know, companies like Skype have said many, many years uh, already ago that 80% of the cost of deploying or the, sorry, of developing applications is because not. And you see more and more uh, often uh, um, updates from Skype and similar applications, peer-to-peer -peer applications, because they are actually uh, needing to patch the application for new uh, ways of doing that. Okay? So that's, that's, that's an obvious reason to, to go away from multiple levels of NAT or even for a single level of NAT. Uh, I have a question actually. How many of you, when you install it, Skype in your, in your uh, computer, have read the Skype license bef before clicking accept? <laughs> you know that we are all uh, criminals when we are accepting that license? You know what happens actually? We are giving, let's suppose I am a, a student from a university or an employee in a company. Uh, what the Skype is doing when you accept the license is using my system, my device, my laptop to carry traffic for others on the network that is not my network, but I accepted the license. And I don't have the power to accept the license for the network of the university of my company. Okay? So what the Skype is doing most of the time is if they cannot, let's suppose we have a Skype conversation. If the Skype conversation cannot go peer to peer, it's going to look for somebody in a university and then will forward the traffic like this, triangular routing, okay? So that guy that accepted the license and is using his computer in a university and he's not the manager of the university, he has not got the right to accept that license in that network. Maybe in his home, but not outside. Read, read the Skype license, you will discover that. Obviously, it seems that university uh, managers are not paying attention to that, but what happens is one day they decide to look into that, or your company owner, okay? Because that's the same in companies, etc., etc. So depending on what is the kind of NAT you have, the traffic can go astray or need to go through third-party networks. And that's also a security thing, of course. It's encrypted, yes, DVDs were also encrypted. But everybody knows how to decrypt them, right? So, so encryption don't make that safe. Okay, so that was uh, DSLite. We have, after a few years of working with DSLite, we discovered that we can make it much simple. And then we invented what we call Lightweight 4 over 6. What is Lightweight 4 over 6? Well, it's actually a simplification of DSLite and we don't know wh why, but in ITF, of course, sometimes we make mistakes and we don't realize that we can make the thing simple until we actually deploy it. So what Lightwave 4 over 6 is doing is basically, instead of moving the NAT to the carrier grade NAT, we keep the NAT in the CPE, okay? So the, te the technology is almost the same as the slide, but keeping the NAT here. Why? Because these boxes are ready to support NAT. There is not any extra overhead. But doing that, you have a lightweight AFTR, a lightweight carrier NAT, which means this is cheaper. Still, we are sharing addresses, so the problem is the same. But we drop the cost of this box. This box is much, much, much uh, cheaper than a standard carrier NAT. Or if you have a big box, expensive one, you can support more connections, obviously, okay, in a single box. Okay? So this is lightweight 4 over 6. And unfortunately, this come to the market in terms of uh, CP supporting it only about three years ago, more or less, while DS Lite has been here for probably seven or eight years. So there is not that much deployment of lightweight 4 over 6, but uh, there is some, and in some big networks. For example, one of the countries that has more deployment of IPv6 in Europe, Greece, is using this one, or Dex Telecom is using in the next generation of CPEs is using also this one. Okay, so we have big networks using with millions of customers using Lightwave 4 over 6. If you need to choose among those two technologies, clearly I will say go to this one. Because it's the same, but you save money here, right? Again, you still have the problem of sharing addresses, but at least your cost, your deployment cost is 
uh, much lower. Next one, NAS64. Everybody heard about NAS64. It looks like a fantastic solution, and it's true. It's a fantastic solution if applications always use DNS. But unfortunately, application developers uh, sometimes are lazy, sometimes don't keep up with the standards, and they didn't realize it since many, many years ago, since 2001, 2002, that IPv6 is coming, and they have uh, still keep deploying applications or keep developing applications which use uh, all libraries or use literal addresses. For example, Skype. Skype, not the recent versions, but Skype was one of the latest applications to have support for IPv6 because Skype was embedding the literal addresses in the packets. So that means that will not work with NAT64. NAT64 is basically a translator. Instead of uh, from IPv4 to IPv4, it's translating from IPv6 to IPv4. So if you have a website that is IPv4 only, and you have in your network IPv6 only, and the website has a DNS record, what NAT64 is doing is with the help of DNS64, is creating a fake quad A record for that IPv4 only website, so the NAT64 box can translate it, okay? So that's the functionality of NAT64 together with the NS64. Now, if you type in your browser 1.1.1.1, it will not work because it's not a DNS record. Or if your application is using all libraries, what we call the socket APIs, it will not work, okay? So that's the thing. NAT64 is good, but it's not perfect. And there is a list, let me skip this. You have here all the details of the NAS64. You want to read them later. This will be the, the picture of NAS64. We have the NAS64 boxes in the, in the ISP network. Uh, you have the IPv6 only network, and we have the DNS64. Now, how you deploy the NS64? Simple. If you have a bind or any uh, regular uh, DNS server, all of them support the DNS64 functionality. It's not new code. It's just a small uh, piece of, of uh, configuration that tells the, the, the DNS to respond to uh, those A records that don't have a corresponding quad A record with a fake one, okay? So that's quite simple. Uh, the thing here is, of course, if this network is IPv6 only, or if you have applications which are IPv6 only because they use literals or socket APIs, they will not work, what I just explained it, okay? So that's, that's the thing with NAT64. It's perfect if you have IPv6 or you have dual stack, but it will not work if you have anything that is IPv4 only. For example, if you have in your home an IPv4 only camera, you will not be able to use that in this network with NAT64. Very, very simple example. If you have an IPv4 only printer, you will not be able to use. You will be able to use inside your network, but not from outside if you want to print from outside, okay? What is breaking NAT64? This was compiled by T-Mobile a few years ago. Maybe some of these applications have been updated. I didn't check at them, but it's just to give you an example. For example, Google Plus, Google Talk, uh, Netflix, Last.fm, Skype, Spotify, all these things don't work through NAT64. Or at least when this was compiled, they were not working. There are many more. It's just an example, okay? I think Skype actually solved it, but I am not really sure if it's already sorted out in all the platforms. Maybe sorted out in Windows, maybe not in Macintosh. I don't know. I didn't check it. But most of these applications and many others will have problems with NAT64, okay? Now, uh, what we did? Uh, somebody working for T-Mobile that was a starting deployment of NAT64 only network in his uh, cellular uh, or mobile network, decided that this was not good enough. So this person, Cameron Byer, started to work in a new idea based on NAT64, but improving it. One thing I didn't mention before, and I am, I am going to take the opportunity here to, to, to say, because somebody asked me before starting the presentation, is what is the difference 
when I share addresses in category NAT versus sharing addresses in NAT64? Well, the difference is in category NAT, you define a number of ports per user. So this is a static definition. In NAT64, you are allocating ports per user as they need them, so you don't have a limitation. What that means, that having, for example, a slash 24 for your category NAT, compared with having it for your NAT64, it's much more efficient, the usage of the addresses for the NAT64, so you need less addresses, because you actually are allocating addresses dynamically as the customers need them, not pre-allocated just dynamically, okay? So for sure, you will uh, need less addresses, and in fact, Sony PlayStation is not blocking NAT64 ranges because they don't have this problem, okay? So uh, what is doing 464XLAT? 464XLAT is doing this thing. We have the NAT64, same as before, in the... A standard for 464XLAT, they give the ter terminology PLAT, provider translator, that's what it means, PLAT, but it's just a change of the name. It's not changing the function at all, not changing the way you code that box, okay? We have also the, the DNS64, and this is interesting here because DNS64 is no longer needed in the case for 464XLAT. And I say this because I don't remember if I have later another slide about this, but I will, I will explain it now. Uh, the bad thing about DNS64 is that we are creating fake quad A records. So if the A records are using DNSSEC, we are breaking them because DNSSEC is meant to detect changes in the records, right? So if you are doing a uh, fake record from an assigned, a DNS signed uh, A record, you are getting a quad A record, and if the host is validating that DNSSEC record, it will fail. However, in NAT64 alone, you are forced to use NAT64. In the case of 464XLAT, you don't need to use this box. And my recommendation, and I have a draft on that uh, in B6Ops, uh, is don't use it. If you are using DNS, uh, sorry, if you are using 464XLAT, better don't use DNS64, okay? You will understand in the next slides how that is sorted out. So in the case of 464XLAT, we have the NAT64, optionally the DNS64, and then we have in the CPE or in the server phone, if it's a server device, we have a function that is called CLAT. The CLAT is a small C code. It takes like this piece of code, nothing else, it's not complex, which is actually doing a NAT46 translation. So what happens is, let me go through because I think it's easier to see it here. Uh, that will be the picture, okay? Let's suppose we have an IPv6 only cellular phone. IPv6 only in the sense that the link to the ISP is IPv6 only. The cellular phone is still has dual stack, but the link to the ISP is IPv6 only. So what happens is when this cellular phone is connected to an IPv6 only web server, or whatever service we are connecting to, it will go straight to which IPv6? No translation at all. Now, if the cellular phone needs to connect with IPv4, it will use the CLAT or the PLAT or both of them, okay? Actually, it will use only the PLAT or both of them. And it's possible to see the three cases here. We have the first case, IPv6 to IPv6, no translation at all, okay, simple. As soon as more and more services, if you have 60% of your network traffic, already going to YouTube, Google, Facebook, etc. you will have 60% of the traffic using this path, right? Now, if you have an application in the cellular phone, for example, a browser, that is going to an IPv4-only website, the NAT64 will do that. 
How? With the help of the DNS64, if you have that one. Now, if you don't have DNS64, or you have here an IPv4 literal, for example, you type in the browser 1.1.1.1, it will get translated twice. So you get a translation from IPv4 to IPv6, you forward the traffic through the ISP network, which IPv6 only, and then at the exit of the translator, you do a NAT64 translation, okay? So if you get rid of the DNS64, you don't have this case. Will be either this one or this one, but you are not using that one. What that means? For the operator, nothing. For the customer, that he is always using the SILAT. So basically, it will spend some more battery, not so much as the NAT in IPv4, but there is some more battery consumption. But for the operator, it's simple because here, you will get some help desk calls. Hey, I am using the NSEC. It's not working. Here, you don't have this problem. So it's up to you to decide if using the NS64 or not. But at this way, you are sure that you don't get any applications broken because those applications are using the NSEC validation, OK? I mean, if the host is doing the NSEC but not validating, no problem. The problem is when the host is doing the validation by himself. Uh, let me skip this one. I think we are good with the time, but just in case. Uh, if you want to see this, this one later and ask me, it's basically a step by step how the addressing changes across the flow, OK? How is NAT64, CLAT, and all these things deployed? Well, you have here a lot of vendors for bot, NAT64, CLAT. Uh, for example, for the demo that we will be running now, uh, I am using Joule, which is a NIC Mexico implementation of, uh, of NAT64 and many other things. I have some slides to explain that later. Uh, we are using also Joule for the CLAT, but in some other occasions, I am using OpenWRT. Okay, so there are many, many implementations, and also Apple, in the Happy Ables version 2, if somebody was here yesterday when I presented Happy Ables 2, in the Happy Ables uh, version 2 already includes the support for, the, for the, a function similar to the SILAT, okay? What about commercial deployment of 464X LAT? Most of the mobile networks in the world are moving to 464X LAT. I think if you have been during the rest of the week, several people in the talks, they said, this is the way, this is the way, 464 is lat. It's not just me saying that. It's not me trying to convince you, it's everybody trying to convince you, okay? So in mobile networks, this is clear. In broadband networks, unfortunately, until recently, we didn't have, unless you use OpenWRT, we didn't have support in CPEs for 464 is lat, but now that's changing. I had a presentation yesterday here in this room where I presented uh, one uh, ITF document that is uh, becoming an RFC in a matter of weeks, hopefully, uh, which took three years for me to convince the, 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 the ITF community that this is the way, but finally they, they got convinced. And this uh, document is actually uh, mandating the support of 464 SLAT in the CPEs. So even if you buy the CP in the supermarket, in one year from now, it should have support for 464 SLAT. Otherwise, don't buy it. Look for another brand, OK? Uh, there are two more technologies. Those technologies have been developed basically by Cisco, and there is not so much adoption of them. There are a few networks in the world using MAP-E, and this is what MAP-E is doing. MAP-E is keeping, like Lightwave 4 over 6, the NAT 4.4, at the CPE, and then is doing also a poor reservation, and MAP E, the E stands for encapsulation. Okay, so it's doing uh, an IPv6, uh, sorry, an IPv4 in IPv6 tunnel for going to what they call, instead of the carry rate, they call it border relay. What is the difference? MAP E is stateless, so the cost of this box is really, really cheap, like in the case of Lightwave 4 over 6. Now, the thing is that MAPI is forcing you a given way to do the dressing plan. 
Okay, so in my case, I don't like that. I really want to be able to do my addressing plan and not depend on a protocol. So I don't really recommend this, and the reality is that very, very, very few networks in the world are doing this at the moment. This can change, but we'll see. The other thing here is the only protocol supported in, in uh, mobile networks is 464XLAT. So do you really think it's a good idea to have one protocol for your mobile network and another one for your fixed network? I don't think so. You don't have a mobile network now? Okay, maybe you have in the future. Or maybe you have uh, a virtual operator in a mobile network. So you really want to have different protocols? What happens if you have a, an hybrid router? And a router that connects your customer with ADSL or with GPON or whatever, but in case the main link fails, you have a plug with an, an LTE stick. Are you going to have different transition mechanisms in both sides of the network? I don't think that's a good idea. I think that's an operational complexity that you don't want in your network. And there is, well, there is a traffic flow for MAPI, and then there is another similar to MAPI protocol, which actually is very, very close to 464XLAT, which is MAP translation. The T stands for translation. So the picture is the same as the previous one, but here you have, as in the case of 464XLAT, in addition to a NAT44, you have a NAT46 and then a NAT64 in the border layer. So as you can see, this is basically 464XLAT, but stateless. That's the difference, okay? So comparison between MAPI and MAPT, basically is the extra 20 bytes for the encapsulation. Okay, so if you compare both of them, that's, that's it basically. This is the tool that Cisco offers in their website to create, depending on your prefix, to create your map E or map T configuration in the router. It's very simple, but it's forcing you to use the dressing plan that the protocol is creating for you. Again, I don't think this is a good idea. I think the dressing plan in any network is something so important that you really need to pay a lot of attention to develop that. You don't want to remember your network sooner or later. I don't think that's a good idea, okay? I did this table. It's not easy. It's not something that works for every network just looking at the table. At the end, if you want to do something similar, you will need to look what is important for you in the network. For example, you want to support IPv4 multicast. You want to support, uh, do you mind about the extra overhead for encapsulations? Do you mind to replace the CPE? Do you mind to share IPv4 ports? So once you answer all these questions, what I did is I put in green uh, those things that are good, and I score the green as one. I put in orange, like a traffic light. Orange scores for half a point, and red scores for zero. So what is the best transition mechanism? 6RD. But we don't have any more IP4 addresses, so we will not do that. I, I didn't talk it about 6, 6RD here. I didn't talk it about 6RD here uh, because the time, and I think it's not something we should recommend, okay? Of course, the alternative is dual stack. Dual stack probably will get 16 or 17 or 20 points. I don't know, I didn't calculate it. But for that, you need, as well as for 6RD, if you want to deploy it correctly, you need public addresses for all your customers. Now, uh, the other mechanism that get more scoring is for example, lightweight 4 over 6, and 464XLAT, MAP E, MAP T, and so on. Obviously, this is getting a much better scoring, and the importance here is uh, if you need to support a cellular network, you are tied to this one. You cannot use none of, of the others. Okay? So that's, that's the thing here. I mentioned briefly before about the sharing of ports. There was a test done by, I think it was here in this region, NTNT, uh, that was 
reducing the number of ports. And when you have, for example, an application like Google Maps, if you have less than 300 ports, then you get this thing, which is the map with uh, black, uh, black holes or, or, or uh, parts of the screen that you don't, you don't get. Okay? Of course, this is the number of ports for every user behind the CPE. If you have a family behind a CPE, and the family has four members, uh, each one is using 300 ports, and you give them just 1,000 ports, it's not enough. Sometimes they will see the problem, sometimes not, depending on what applications they are using at the same time. If there is only one user, probably it's okay. But it depends, because more and more applications are using te technologies like Ajax, that what basically do is increase the number of ports that they're using at the same time, right? So you run out of, of ports uh, faster. Uh, I mentioned several documents across the presentation. One of them is the actual uh, document for CPE supporting IPv6. This is uh, supporting only uh, 6RD and DS Lite as transition mechanisms. So this is RFC 7084. And then there is a new document that is the one I mentioned. It will be hopefully an RFC in a matter of weeks, which is the one that uh, is supporting for the CPEs uh, 464 XLAT, Lightweight 4 over 6, MAPT, MAPE, and also DS Lite. Okay, so that's, that's the thing. We want to make sure the vendors of CPEs are supporting those mechanisms. So when an ISP decides to deploy one or the other, with the same CPE can work in a different network. So even if a customer goes to the supermarket to buy a CPE, he can work today in this uh, ISP, tomorrow the other is ISP is using another mechanism, the same CPE can be used. Okay, so that's simple for both ISPs, vendors, and users, of course. Uh, there is another document that, uh, even if it's not related to this presentation, I think you should read, is uh, the BCOP. BCOP stands for Best Current Operational Practices that we have published in RIPE. Uh, and the BCOP RIPE 69 uh, is telling you what is the recommended, uh, let's say, uh, addressing plan for customers. Uh, so if you need to give the customers a slash 56, a slash 48, why? If you want to give the customers persistent addresses or uh, dynamic addresses like in IPv4, why, and so on, okay? There is another document that I am working on which is point-to-point -point links with IPv6. Many people understand that point-to-point -point links in IPv6 must be slash 127. This is not what the actual document says. The actual document is saying the routers must support slash 127. But I think the best recommendation we can do is have the point-to-point -point links as a slash 64. Uh, and then the document I mentioned about the NAT64 and 464X LAT guidelines, uh, deployment guidelines, okay? So this is not just for ISPs, but also for enterprise networks, because there are a lot of chances that in the next few years, enterprise networks will be IPv6 only, and this is the way they can, they can deploy it, okay? Oh, this is what I mentioned before about DNSSEC. I, I was not sure if I have this slide here, so I, I will skip it because I already explained that. It's true here something that most of the cellular applications today don't use DNSSEC, but the operating systems have libraries so application developers can do that. So even if today you don't have this problem in a cellular phone, it may come. And what happens if the cellular phone is doing tethering and there is a laptop behind the cellular phone doing the validation? It's broken. So that's, that's the thing here. Performance. This is measured in, uh, by Facebook a few years ago in cellular networks, okay? But it's basically the same in non-cellular networks because some people is deploying things like carry NAT and you have the NAT, the carry NAT, and also people like Facebook has now in their data centers IPv6 only. At the end, in terms of performance, you can get up to 40% better performance with IPv6 compared with IPv4. How that's measured? It's time to complete an HTTP GET, okay? So it's not like real speed, but what it matters for the user is how fast I get the web page completed, right? That's the thing. 
So this is Im important. With IPv6 only, you take advantage of this. If you keep going to IPv4, you are getting less performance than your competitors. Multi-service network. This is what I mentioned before about having uh, a single transition mechanism for Sys4XLAT in your cellular network, but also in your customers uh, for broadband. So it makes sense to have a single mechanism. I think now it's clear which mechanism I am supporting. I said at the beginning, I will tell you at the end. Uh, I really think it's the only way to go. I don't think it makes sense to have multiple transition mechanisms in the world. I think 464LAT, XLAT is already the winner. If we look at the numbers of cellular subscribers in the world, 464SLAT has much more users in terms of millions or tens or hundreds of millions than all the other mechanisms together. I think that's a clear sign of who, uh, which one of the mechanisms is, is the winner. So what we are missing, CP supporting 464SLAT, hopefully that comes to the market. This is an example of a residential network having support for, uh, for 464SLAT. Uh, so let's suppose an ISP has a slash 32. The ISP got a, also a, a slash 24 for the, for, the, for the translation, for the NAT64. The NAT64 and the DNS64, in case he's using, can be implemented as virtual machines. You don't need physical hardware to do that. So you can have multiple virtual machines running that and doing uh, uh, high availability in your network. You can have an optimization of the path for all the IPv6 traffic. You don't need to run all the IPv6 traffic through the virtual machine. That can be just a plain uh, IPv6 default route. And then you only bring here the traffic that it needs to get translated. So the customer uh, CPE will have the CLAT machine. Here is IPv6 only, IPv6 only, IPv6 only. So you have only dual stack here in the NAT64. The rest is IPv6 only, but the customer is getting dual stack, which is what it matters, right? The customer applications don't, don't get broken. The customer devices, which are IPv4 only, still work. That's the thing. Jul, by the way, questions up to here? We have just 30 minutes, but I think we are okay with the time. Any question? I didn't say at the beginning. Interrupt me at any time. You have any question? No questions? We have an exam at the exit of the... <laughs> okay. So, uh, NAS64, DNS64, and JUL. Uh, I don't have any special interest in, in this tool, but I think it's fantastic. So, I, I, I think I should talk about that because also we are using it for, for the demo. This is an open source tool. Somebody mentioned already yesterday in, an, in another presentation. <coughs> Um, okay. Yeah. I yes. Um, just now you mentioned a Skype, and the traffic will go through it. Um, I mean, it will basically become uh, uh, peering. Basically, it's a P2P application. Are you saying it's the same issue for any peer-to-peer -peer application? Not all of them, but many peer-to-peer -peer applications do something similar to Skype. They use what they call super nodes to carry the traffic when they cannot reach real peer-to-peer. -peer. Yes. That's the case for IPv4. In IPv6, you don't need that. I think everybody got, got the question, but, but it's true that please use the mic because the remote participants, yeah, I forgot to, to say that. Clear? That's, that's, that was your question? Yes. Yeah, perfect, thank you. So. Uh, Joul, you can find a lot of documentation on Joul, how to compile it, it's very simple. You don't need to have any knowledge about Linux or compilation to do that. It's just a step by step. It gives you several examples of usage. Uh, and uh, basically it's an open source for what we call the SIT. SIT stands for a Stateless IPACMP Translation Algorithm. If we have time, I have a second part of the presentation to, to look at IPv6 only data centers. We'll look into that. Uh, which, with Joule, you can do many, many things. Uh, it's doing both stateful and stateless NAT64. 
Um, so basically, it's helping to, to, to with the IPv IPv4 uh, exhaustion, right? So what are, at the moment, the defined architectures for Joule? You can use Joule as CDC. CDC, I just mentioned it, is having a data center with IPv6 only. If we have time, we will see it at the end of the presentation, after the demo. Uh, it supports, of course, 464 xlat and um, it supports also a new functionality for CDC, which is dual translation mode, okay? Um, we don't have time to go into the details of that, but, but it's, it's like uh, basically the reverse of 464 xlat for the data centers. Um, you can run Joule in a single interface. You don't need to have a server with multiple interfaces. It's not optimal, but it works, okay? So those are some of the features of, of Joule. In fact, here in my demo, I am, I am doing that. I have just one uh, Ethernet port in my laptop, so I am using the, the income and outgoing paths in the same interface. Um, it's a node-based translation. You can use also what they call in Linux uh, namespaces to grab Joule. So, so it's, it's very sophisticated in that sense. And it offers also high availability. It has a daemon that allows constant synchronization between different Joule machines. So in case one fails, the other one keeps going. There is also what we call the explicit, uh, the explicit, uh, uh, explicit uh, uh, mapping table. Uh, and this is an example of how you do that. For example, if you have a single IPv4 address, you will map into a single IPv6 address. If you have a slash 24, you have from 24 to 32, you have eight bits. So you need eight bits in the IPv6 prefix, okay? So that's everything the same. It's quite simple to understand the, the concept of this one-to-one -one, uh, mapping. Uh, and this is the demo that we are going to run. If you want to test in your own laptop, you need to connect to this SSID, ipv 6 lab password is lab as ipv 6 And what I am going to do is, I am going to explain the demo. I will show it from my own laptop, but you can try in your own computer, okay? So what we have here is a connection to internet. Uh, I have a point-to-point -point link with IPv4 to the APNIC network. My router, which is, let me take this microphone. Is it working now? Yeah. So I have this small router here, which is a, is a small uh, PC, fanless PC, which uh, I think is AMD with four cores and so on. And this is running uh, an Ubuntu, nothing else, okay? So that box is actually our NAT64 and DNS64. For this demo, I have enabled NAT64. I could disable it, but never mind. Um, so this box is translating uh, the IPv6 prefix that I got from APNIC, which is a slash 60. I am using the first slash 64 of this slash 60 for the point-to-point -point link. This is a virtual machine running on my Apple. Okay, so this is the, D the DNS64 and NAT64. This is the CLAT running in another Ubuntu in a virtual machine in my, in my Mac. And then you are here. You are connected with the wireless. I have set up two access points. So we don't need to change the configuration of the uh, APNIC network. And in those access points, you get a private addressing space which IPv4, and a public or global slash 64, okay? So if you connect to that network, uh, you will be able, even if this is only IPv6, you will be able to reach anything in the world that it's dual stack or IPv4 only or IPv6 only. Let me, you show the demo in my own laptop. I don't know how I will hold my microphone, but I will try. <laughs> Okay, so you switch my glasses, otherwise I have a problem. Thank you. So the thing here, if we get the screen, is coming or not? 
Okay. So the thing here is I am going to show you the, oh, perfect. We lost the screen for some reason. Okay. So first thing I want to show you is my wireless interface is flapping. Okay. My wireless interface got automatically, you see it here, it got automatically a private address space. I don't think it's the, well, we'll, we'll try to keep going. We got a private addressing space, uh, and we got also IPv6. I keep going, okay? If you look at your own computer, you can, you can follow that. And we got also, there is a cable problem or what? My converter is working fine because I use it almost every day, so I don't think that's my converter. The other port, maybe? It's back to yeah. Oh, look. It's a problem with the main screen, not the second screen. So maybe it's the beamer, not the. No, that's not my screen. If you just go to the to the first connection, I think in the in the secondary screens it was okay. I didn't ch check at that before, but while we're doing this, yeah. Is there any questions? Yeah, exactly. Questions. Okay, so here we have, uh, of course, a standard IPv6 addressing, global addresses. We have private addresses. So let me close this, and then if I go to a terminal like this, I can do uh, ping six, one, 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 sorry, ping one, 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 let me make it bigger so you can see it much better. Okay, like that, oops. So we are able to work with literals, that's fine. We are able to trace route to that one. And look at this. We see here in the trace route that we get twice to the same address because that's the CLAT, the CLAT translation, OK? And we can also do the same, which I think here I have a trace route to Google, OK? So we are doing a trace route with IPv6 to Google. Of course, we can ping to Google. OK? And we can also do ping 4 to Google. And we can do trace root 4 to Google. OK? So it works with DNS, IPv4, DNS, IPv6, and literals. And even more than that, if I go to a browser, and I type here, for example, El Mundo, it's a Spanish new newspaper. You can see here, with this application that I use, which is IPv6 foo, that I am connecting with IPv6, and some assets from this web page that are not IPv6 enabled, they get translated with a special prefix, which is the NAT64 prefix, okay? And if I go to something which is not IPv6 enabled, which is another newspaper in Spain, is still working for me. We can see here that is using IPv4, okay? But get translated because it has DNS. And the last one, I can go to a literal, yeah, that one, and it's working. And of course, this is also uh, not available with IPv6, and in this case, it doesn't get trans translated because it has no DNS because I am using a literal. So in this case, don't get translated. 
by the NAT64. It's getting translated by the CLAT. By the way, I didn't show you, but the CLAT is a virtual machine that I am running here, and that's, that's the CLAT. It's just an Ubuntu, okay? And that's, that's it. You can, you can switch to the, to the other projector. So that's the demo. It's if you try this with your own laptop, you should get the same. You just need to get connected to the... You just need to get connected to the... To the IPv6 dash lab network. Here you have the details. You connect to this SSID. Remember, my connectivity to APNIC network is dual stack, which is a single IPv4 address. But our internal connection here is IPv6 only. And the customer, this is the customer network, is getting dual stack and working with both IPv4 only, IPv6 only, uh, dual stack, IP for literals, anything is working here, okay? I can even connect to my VPN using a private IPv4 address, it works. Everything works. Um, here is basically the different steps I did in the demo. So I tried ping, trace root, to bot literals, IPv4, IPv6. Uh, we browse it to uh, bot IPv4 enabled websites, IPv6 enabled ones, uh, literal uh, address in a website. And if you don't have this extension in Chrome or, or Firefox, you will be interested in getting that. That was the, the extension that showed me when I was connecting to a website if I was using IPv4 or, IP, or IPv6. That's very useful. And fortunately, it's not available for, for Internet Explorer or, or Safari, but for Firefox and Chrome, it's, it's good to have. Questions up to here? Well, if you want to see the setup, let's see if we have questions and I show you what is the configuration. Yeah, there is a mic over there somewhere. If not, we just use that one. Hello. Uh, just a small question. Yeah. Um, uh, for that NAT64, uh, is, does, uh, does NAT overload also apply there? NAT? NAT overload. What that means for you? I mean, like, one mul one uh, multiple IPs can ex uh, NAT overload to one public IP multiple times. I'm not sure to understand for, what... For example, uh, yeah. if, you, if you do a net overload for IPv4 to a public IP, so you can have multiple private IPs behind that public IP. Oh, yeah, 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 of yeah. course. Uh, here, our example is just one, one range, but if you look, I, I am doing a slash 10 range for the private network, so you can have many private, different private uh, networks or subnets running with a single IPv4 address. Of course, for this demo, a single IPv4 address is sufficient, if you have 1,000 customers, I'll go, I will tell you, you need to have maybe a slash 24 or something, okay? But that's, that's dynamic, yes. Okay, thank you. More questions? So, just to give you an idea about the configuration, in my NAT64 box, my router, I just stop the network manager because sometimes it creates problems, I stop router advertisement because that box uh, is, is statically, in this case, configured to my, my virtual machine. I stop the DHCP before and DHCP server. Uh, I enable forwarding because I want that box to behave as a router. Uh, so I enable routing forwarding. I disable uh, offload uh, uh, optimization because that may bring down the performance, so even if here we will not notice it, in a real deployment you really want to do that. Uh, both in the host and in the virtual machines, if you are running that in virtual machines, and then I have uh, an, a static route to the slash 60 that uh, APNIC provided to me, okay? So that static route is pointing to my virtual machine in my Macintosh, which is connected by Ethernet in this case, okay? And then I r just run the jewel to do the translation from the standard NAT64 prefix to 
the address, which in this case is not a pool, it's a single address that is uh, being used by my router to go to IPv4, okay? Uh, the DNS64 setup is very simple. I have the forwarders. In this case, I am using Google forwarders as forwarders. Uh, and then I have this statement here that is telling, please translate uh, the A records to quad A records using this prefix, which is the standard NAT64 prefix, and exclude a few uh, prefixes from IPv6 that should not be translated, okay? So that's the configuration of the DNS64, and I am asking the DNS64 to not break DNSSEC, but this only works a little, not for the 100% of the cases. So this is an optimization, but not necessarily will solve all the problems. I believe about 1.72% of the uh, DNSSEC uh, servers will be broken even with this today, okay? According to calculations that we have done, it's about between 1.7 and 2% of the servers will be still broken with this. That's why I recommend not using the NS64, but I wanted you to see the configuration. The SILAT, the SILAT configuration is very similar. It's almost the same, but in this case, I am running the router advertisement because I want you to get automatically an IPv6 address. I am running also the DHCP uh, server because I want you to get also an IPv4 address. Uh, again, enable forwarding and routing, uh, disable of load, and then I am telling Joule to translate using the standard uh, NAT64 uh, prefix, and then I am converting the private addressing space that we are using here to the prefix that we use for the translation. Um, so. One thing I didn't mention is we are getting as last 60 from APNIC. I am using the first as last 60 for the point-to-point -point link. I am using the second as last uh, 60. What is it? Okay, I don't have it here. The, I, I don't have here the, the configuration of my interfaces, but the second slash 64 is being used for my interfaces, and then the third one, which is the colon two, I am using that for the translation of the NAT64, uh, sorry, the SILA translation, okay? So we use several slash 64s to make this as stateless as possible. You could do that stateful, but don't make sense because we have enough IPv6 addresses to do that stateless, right? And that's, that's it about the demo and the configuration and so on. You can easily reproduce this uh, in your own uh, lab and so on. Questions? No questions? We have 10 minutes. So if there is no question, I keep going because this is just five minutes presentation and we'll have more questions afterwards. Let me skip some of them. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, this is when you have a data center and you run out of IPv4 addresses for the data center. You don't need that, okay? And in fact, Facebook and Google and many other folks are doing that. They just have uh, IPv6 in their data centers. And what they do is they do um, let me skip all this. Uh, what they do basically is they keep the data center which IPv6 only. They have CTC, which is CTC border relay, which is like almost the same we are doing here with the CLAT, with the 464X LAT, but for the reverse functionality. Oops, no problem. Okay, so uh, we have the reverse functionality because here we have uh, everything here in the data center as IPv6 only, and we have a pool of addresses here to be able, of IPv4 addresses here to be able to expose those hosts, which are IPv6 only, to the outside IPv4 world. So a representation of this 
is something like that. We have all the internet which IPv4 addresses, and that fits in a slash 96 in IPv6. That's it. So we have a one-to-one -one mapping. You can see every single IPv4 address match a single IPv6 address. So every possible internet address will fit in a single slash 96 in your data center, right? And this is uh, dynamically allocated by the CDC border, uh, DC border relay. Uh, and this will be one example of traffic flow according to that. And I think that was the last slide. Support is basically the same as we had for 464XLAT. You can see this as when you have load balancers in your network. You can have load balancers having public IPv4 addresses to public ones, okay? Sorry, to private ones. This is the same, but having a few public IPv4 addresses to global IPv6 addresses. So it's just uh, the reverse function of the NAT64, but in a stateless way. So everything here don't need any state. It's quite uh, powerful in that, in that sense. And I think that that was the last slide. Questions? Almost right in time. <laughs> Get the mic, yes, please. Hello. <clears throat> uh, just a question on uh, Net64. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you please uh, clarify what's, um, what's the, the difference? Because uh, in a sense, uh, the normal Net uh, uh, at the moment, it's just doing source, right? Just change the source and uh, in normal, Net in the environment, but since uh, in my in my understanding of Net Net uh, sixty four, it will do Net two times. No, Net sixty four is doing a single Net. In a regular Net four four, in IPv four wall Net four four, uh, which we often refer to as Net. Okay, Net is Net four four. We translate. We don't translate the protocol. We translate a private address to a public one. For the for that going and then on the reverse for the incoming, right? In the NAT64, we do also a single translation, but in this case, it's not a matter of translating the address; it's a matter of translating between protocols. We translate IPv6 inside to IPv4 outside. Okay. Now, if you refer to 464xLAT. There may be situations where you translate twice. And those situations, let's try to see. This is not very quick, but we will reach that at some point. OK, here, uh, this one. So the NAS64 I just referred is this case. We just translate from IPv6 to IPv4. Now, if you are using the CLAT, and you use the CLAT when? When you don't want to use the NS64, or when you have here literals or all IPIs. In this case, you do two translations. One a stateless translation here, this is a stateless, and one a stateful translation here. So the NAT64, in the case of NAT64 and 464XLAT, it's a stateful, okay? The same as NAT44, it's a stateful. While the CLAT is a stateless, because we have so many IPv6 addresses that we don't care to invest one slash 64 for this stateless translation, okay? And that's why, when I was explaining uh, 10 minutes ago, that I got a slash 60, but I am using from the slash 60, one slash 64 for the point-to-point -point link, one for the internal network that we have here, and another one for the translation. I could do a stateful, yes, but why? I have sufficient slash 64s, and that means I don't keep a state. So in that sense, this is more efficient than NAT44, of course, because NAT44 need to take a state. Here, we don't need a state. 
Mike, Mike. Otherwise, the remote people don't hear us. In, in the case of if you have um, like a, a server on your on your IPv4 um, uh, network inside, yeah. In, in that case, you will do the um, twice. You can right? do. You can do. Uh, you mean with 464x LAT or CDC? Because it's different situation. Which, which this one, you can have exactly the same as when you have NAT44, you can have rules to allow the incoming traffic, okay? But the difference is that the rules need to be set up here, not here. The rules need to be set up in the ISP network. What happens? Residential customers usually don't need that. Very few residential customers have servers inside their network. And if they have that, they should start using IPv6. And for the IPv6, they don't need rules. OK? If you have a residential customer that has servers inside, I will say offer to that customer dual stack, not 464 slab. That's the easier way. And probably that customer should be in a different category of what he's paying, because he's going to get a static IPv4 address as well, right? In Spain, for example, if I want to have a static IPv4 address, I need to pay 20 euros per month just for the static address. The, 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 my fiber connection is only 40 euros per month, and I have uh, 600 megabits bidirectional. But for the IPv4 address, I pay half the cost as extra half the cost of the uh, fiber connection. So I think that's, that's quite reasonable. I don't think 20 euros is the price. I think that's very expensive. I will say 5 euros, 6 euros is okay. But you really want to provide, in that case, to those customers, you really want to them dual stack. It's like almost a, a, an SME, right? SME or corporate, you, win, you want to give them a dual stack because they may be running many, many things that still need today dual stack. Additional questions? Don't be shy. Yeah, over there. Jaime, that's my name, and from PNG. Uh, in PNG, we, we adopt a lot of uh, networks because our country is very mountainous. And so in towns, we do fiber. And connecting provinces or cities, we do microwave for most satellite. And to migrate from IPv4 to IPv6, and if you need to do that. To transition. And, I to guess transition, you say yes. to transition. Yeah, and to transition. So with IPv6, there's additional uh, frame address, and the payload increases with trying to transition. So how can, uh, that, because with satellite, you know, obviously you get about average 500 milliseconds delay on round trip. So how can that help with uh, us trying to deploy IPv6 on satellite? Would that affect any applications? Would that affect the throughput and the committed rate between sites and to the customer and user uh, devices? Well, you are asking me to solve a problem of satellite networks, not a problem of IP. Uh, I mean, uh, really, we cannot do nothing about that unless the satellite providers start doing some kind of optimization for IPv6 traffic. Unfortunately, and, and here we have one expert on satellite that can tell probably more than, than myself, unfortunately, there are many satellite providers that not yet are providing uh, IPv6 services, right? So that's, that's an additional burden. Yeah, so sorry, can yeah. I, with, uh, with that, we, we try to do net performance, but then, like, uh, if there's some experts in the room or from HEPNIC, if we can get some more help in saying, okay, this is how you need to do deploying IPv6 on fiber, on copper radio, but on, set, on satellite. Yeah. Because in the Pacific, you know, we, as, we distributed in, in the ocean, so satellite is one technology. It can't go away in the next few years. We, still, we will be still keeping satellites. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, some that's, help from that's HEPNIC, clear. That's that clear. would help. 
I mean, at the end, the, the extra overhead from IPv4 to, to IPv6 is instead of 20 bytes header, 40. It's not that much, but, but I understand that at the end, this, this matters in satellites. So I am, I, I am not uh, an expert in satellite to tell you uh, how the satellite providers are optimizing if they are actually this, this thing, right? So I don't know if you, you can say something about that. If you have any idea of what they really are doing and what are the plans or? Uh, my impression is that for a lot of the satellite providers, IPv6 is actually in the too hard basket at the moment. Um, the, uh, you know, 40 versus 20 bytes, um, uh, uh, you know, change for the uh, IP header size. Um, that's actually an issue because one of the things that do tend to happen um, with satellite links, for example, because they have this um, the susceptibility to noise and this sort of stuff as well, uh, is that sometimes they get very small MTUs. So what, what, what actually happens is you get fragmentation along the way um, uh, and uh, your path MTU uh, settles on a smaller thing. So, uh, and the other thing, of course, is, is that when you look at real IP traffic, um, you often find that it's actually full of very small packets, and it's not like the, you know the data's all going one way and the uh, and the X are all going the other way. You get lots of ICMP and you know stuff like that floating around as well. So that does actually make a uh, make a difference. That said, uh, once we sort of get around to cleaning that particular sector up, and I think there's a lot of cleanup you know that needs doing in the micro in the, in the transition over to IPv6 eventually. One of the advantages that we're having in this respect compared to say for example um, a um, you know major carrier router that sits on a major you know hub node on the internet is what you have on the major hub nodes on the internet is you've got basically traffic from all manner of networks going to all manner of other networks and um, in the case of a satellite uh, linked to a local ISP you know exactly which network's on the other side. And um, if you do your IP address management you know, well enough, then I think there'll probably be a plethora of um, uh, header compression um, uh, schemes you could come up with. And the only thing you really need to do is compress before you go into the satellite link proper and then decompress again uh, over on the other side once you've got bandwidth to boot, uh, you know, boot again with, um, you know, with fiber available. So I don't think this is ultimately going to be a problem. I think it's more a matter of somebody actually you know, going and developing the solutions for it. And um, that ball I see very much um, in the court of the people who, um, uh, who basically operate um, and, uh, well, not operate, but um, who, who, who design and, uh, and build uh, satellite terminal equipment because fact, they're the people who have, uh, have to do with the Gileads of this world, right? In fact, there is, uh, for example, in, in uh, EOT protocols, we used uh, uh, header compression for IPv6, which is very efficient. It could be used as well for satellites. So I don't think that's, that's really a, a problem. And you probably can compress much more than in IPv4, actually. So that's, that's the, the fact in, in, in IoT. So it's a matter of, uh, as you said, somebody developing the solution. Uh, so actually, it's up to the providers to really get their hands on deploying IPv6, I will say. It's not really that much a problem. Yeah, there is another question over there. Hi, Jody. Hi. Uh, I just have one question, few, one actually. Uh, has this been deployed through, like, on a large scale, the XLAT? 464 XLAT is the, uh, the transition mechanism that got more deployment in the world. Okay. If, uh, you look, if you look at the cellular networks, more, most of the cellular networks are using 464 XLAT. So in terms of hundreds of millions of users, is the one that has more deployment. Now, if you ask me about broadband, yes. not yet, because there is not uh, popular CPEs that support 464X LAT, but I can tell you that I have been running trials during more than two years in three different ISPs, average 10,000 users each, and there is no complaint. Oh, okay. Okay, so. Yeah. It's not, it's not a scale of millions of customers, but they, those are ISPs, uh, small ISPs in Latin America, and they don't have millions of customers anyway, so they cannot run more, but, but it's, it's working. I mean, it's, it's, you have seen it here. It, it, it just works. Okay, so uh, on your presentation, it's based off the mobile customers, not the broadband. Yes, right now where there is 
deployment in a big, big, big scale is in mobile. But there is no difference. And if you read the, the RFC for 464XLAT, it tells clearly that this is not just for mobile. Most of the people has been reading this as this is only for mobile. No, 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 no. The protocol, it says this is valid exactly the same for a cellular phone or a CPE. No difference. Okay. okay. Thanks. So th there, there, there must not be any difference in using in one way or the other, because it's the same protocol. Nothing changed. Nothing different. It's like if you ask me, is running IPv6 in larger scale in mobile? Forget about transition mechanism. Yes. Is running in, in uh, broadband? Yes. There is no difference between the implementation of one or the other. It's the same. OK? Thank you. Last question. We are running already into the break. No questions? So that's it. Thank you very much.